All right. Well, thank you guys again. This is Mr. Zawacki, and today what we're going to be talking about is bacteria, protists, and fungi. We're going to learn about what they are, what they do, what they do for us, and, and also how they're different from each other, too. And these are kind of makes up your microorganisms or small organisms that are alive on Earth. All right, so first of all, we're going to talk about the smallest living things on Earth, bacteria. Um, bacteria is everywhere. Wherever you touch, anywhere inside of your house, outside of your house, um, anywhere, um, even on your own bodies, there's bacteria everywhere. Um, some parts of the bacteria, it's very simple. Flagella is just the long tail that some of them have, like right here. Cell membrane, we know that from the cell. That's just the membrane that surrounds the cell. Ribosomes, those are the little dots inside the cell that make protein. They're really small organelles. Pili um, are just extensions of the cell that help it move. Chromosome, well, that's our DNA or the DNA that are found inside bacteria. And then the cell wall as well. So bacteria has both cell wall and cell membrane for most. So similar structures to our cell, just actually simpler than our eukaryotic cell. Bacteria does not have as many organelles as our eukaryotic cell because bacterial cells are prokaryotic. How they reproduce, definitely need to know that. It's called the process of binary fission. B-I is two. Fission means separate, the process by which bacteria replicate chromosomes and then the cell divides. It's a power of doubling. They just keep doubling. That's what bacteria cells do. If you double a penny just 20 times, so if you have a penny, you double it to two pennies. Two becomes four. Four becomes eight. Eight becomes 16. If I would do that same math problem 20 times, one penny doubled 20 times would equal $10,485.76, or 1,048,576 pennies. That just shows you how quickly bacteria can reproduce, especially the harmful kind. So just by doubling 20 times, you can have over a million bacteria come out of one. And, to put it even crazier, the average bacteria doubles every 15 to 20 minutes. So just in probably five or six hours, you can get start with one bacteria and get to over a million. Endospores, what are they? Well, they're thick-walled reproductive structures that can resist heat, drought, and radiation, sometimes living centuries before breaking open. These are, this is like almost like the seed that surrounds the bacteria. It helps it live in pretty crazy environments. So that's what an endospore does. and also helps it reproduce. Okay, so how do we organize bacteria? How do we classify them? Well, there's two kingdoms. Remember that from last week, or the week before about classification. When we classify bacteria, there are two types. There's the archaea bacteria, which is like the ancient bacteria, and then there's the U bacteria, which is like the normal bacteria that's found everywhere around us. Um, U bacteria, I'm going to talk about them first because they're, they're everywhere. They live in much less harsh environments than archaea bacteria. There are many types and ways to classify them. Archaea bacteria, on the other hand, is ancient bacteria. This is believed to be the first living thing on Earth ever, like over a couple billion years ago. And there are three types of archaeobacteria, but either way, they live in crazy environments. You won't see archaeobacteria around us. Um, they, they are located at the bottoms of ocean trenches, um, sometimes in volcanoes. Sometimes, like just think of really extreme environments. That's where archaeobacteria will be found. There are methanogens, the ones that produce methane. Those are usually around volcanoes. Thermophiles, they're found in heated conditions. So these are the ones around 
uh, volcanoes maybe, and also um, heated vents underneath the, earth, um, the ocean, and halophiles, very salty conditions, maybe in the Dead Sea um, or Salt Lake or something like that. Um, ancient bacteria will be found in crazy ancient areas, whereas you bacteria, the second kingdom, this is the normal bacteria that's found pretty much everywhere. How do they also classify bacteria? Well, once they know it's either archaea or eubacteria, then they'll separate them based on their shape. They can be a sphere, which is pochi. This is all, I believe, Latin language, um, Latin or Italian. I would go with Latin. Rods are bacilli. Spiral, that's an easy one, spirilla. Kind of sounds like we're picking different pastas, but they're actually bacteria types. Chains are streptococci, so it's a chain of spheres. Or clusters would be staphylococci, that's just a cluster of sphere bacteria. So these are all the shapes. They can also be separated by their cell wall. If it's gram positive or gram negative, they can separate them that way. Nutrition, does the bacteria produce its own energy or does it feed off of something? autotroph or heterotroph. And what type of respiration do they have? Do they need oxygen? That's an aerobe. Do they not need oxygen? That's an anaerobe. So that's how they classify and separate and organize the many millions of bacteria species that are on Earth. They separate them by their, their shapes. They separate them by their cell wall composition, gram positive or gram negative. They separate them by their nutrition, is it an autotroph or a heterotroph, and they separate them by respiration, aerobic or anaerobic. The roles of bacteria, they can be decomposers. They break down dead stuff. Um, we know what decomposers do. They convert fixed nitrogen into usable forms of nitrogen. Does anybody know what that's called? when they convert nitrogen gas into usable forms for plants. It's a little bit of a review from module four. Can anybody guess what it's called when bacteria converts nitrogen gas into usable forms of plants? It, it is part of the nitrogen cycle. Good job, Alana. Do you know the name of the process, though, when they turn the, the gas into, like, usable forms so they can grow. You just need to put pretty much these two words together. And it's called nitrogen, somebody's typing. Good job, Chris. Yep, it is called nitrogen fixation. So bacteria can do that, that's good. They can break down dead stuff, they can turn nitrogen into a usable form. They can also do symbiosis. Remember, that's where two organisms live close together. Well, that definitely bacteria has a symbiotic relationship even with us. Um, we, I just read an article the other day. Scientists discovered over 1,950 new species of bacteria living inside of our bodies. Not harmful, but symbiotic bacteria bacteria that works with you to help you. But crazy, there's over 1,900 new species just discovered inside of our bodies. So they can be good, they could be decomposers, but we also know bacteria can be bad. Um, strep throat, staph infections, um, botulism, there's many bad bacteria too. But I would say there's way more good than bad. Here's some diseases caused by bacteria. Tooth decay is from Streptococcus mutans. That's the genus and species name of it. And um, to prevent it, you just have regular dental hygiene. Brush your teeth. Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia, Borrelia some crazy word, Burgdorfin. But anyways, um, it protects, well, it gets it from tick bites, which is a bacterial infection. Tetanus, we've heard of tetanus shots and things like that. You gotta get the shots because it blocks this pathogen from 
becoming invasive in your body. Tuberculosis was a big problem about 100 years ago. We now have a vaccination for that. Salmonella food poisoning, that comes out all the time, sometimes with lettuce that we heard recently. Um, it's because of a harmful bacteria, salmonella, and tendonitis. And if the proper food handling practices would stop that. <clears throat> Pneumonia is caused by bacteria in your lungs. You just got to have good health and, you know, be healthy. Cholera is another one. That um, is another pathogen bacteria that causes it in dirty water supply. So we know there's harmful bacteria, but you guys need to know that there's many more good U bacteria um, that's found everywhere that helps us out too. So you got to have bacteria on Earth. There's good and bad, um, but they are the most numerous living things on Earth. There's more bacteria species on Earth than any other species. They're also the smallest and, and most simple. So we can guess that they were one of the first things on Earth to ever live on Earth because they're very simple lives that they live. All right, so getting a little bigger now. So we got bacteria done. Then we get into protists. And these contain the most diverse. It means they're very, very, very different. Um, and that's a tricky thing about protists. A lot of scientists didn't know about this group, and they just put things that didn't belong anywhere into this group originally. But they began to organize them and make sense of it all. So it is the most diverse organism. Um, most protists are unicellular like bacteria, but some are going to be multicellular like fungus, plants, and animals. So this is kind of in the middle between bacteria and fungus. They could be autotrophic or heterotrophic, like bacteria. They can either produce their own food or eat food. Um, cell walls are sometimes present. Remember, bacteria, they're always present. And they're composed of cellulose is the cell wall, just like plants. And they're also eukaryotic cells. Remember how bacteria is prokaryotic? Well, protists, fungus, plants, animals are all eukaryotic. So again, scientists thought that the prokaryotic cell evolved to the eukaryotic cell, which made all of these new species. There are several protist types. Um, because the protist kingdom tends to be a dumping ground for organisms that don't quite fit anywhere, it's like your island of misfits, the organisms in this kingdom tend to closely resemble organisms of other kingdoms. So when you look at one organism in a protus at, that's a protus, sometimes they are similar to plants or animals or fungus. And guess what? That's how they organized the three types of protus. So there are three main types of protus. They are plant-like, animal-like, or fungus-like. So Protus will follow the trend of one of those three. Just depends on what protus you're looking at, because there's so many of them. First of all, plant-like protus. Well, they act like plants, right? They use sunlight to make their own food. They do photosynthesis, just like plants. Algae is a great example of a protus that acts like a plant. Sometimes we think algae is a plant. Um, but it's not. It's a protist that acts like a plant. And they do not have roots, stems, or leaves. They could be unicellular or multicellular. And there are six main types of plant-like protists. We have the three types of algae, green, red, and brown. We also have dinoflagellates, diatoms, and euglenoids. If anybody's ever heard of red tide, that's very similar to the red algae or dinoflagellates that are found in the ocean. So what, so to learn a couple things here, plant-like protists, they can be, you know, helpful, like green algae or diatoms, or they can be harmful, like red algae or dinoflagellates that cause problems. Either way, 
These are protists that act like plants. Algae is an example. Right, and I don't even want to get into red, red tide. It's, uh, I have my own thoughts about that. Anyways, animal-like protists, um, they are unicellular heterotrophs. So these ones act like animals. Remember how the plant-like ones are autotrophs? because they make their own energy. Well, animals, just like us, we're heterotrophs. We have to eat to get our energy. Well, so does animal-like protists. The catch is they're only single-celled, but they are heterotrophs, so they do eat. And these are called protozoa, and they're, according, they're, they're grouped according to how they move. So there's four types of animal-like protists. Amoebas, flagellates, ciliates, and sporozoans. Very easy to see how they move. Amoebas are like a blob, so they kind of just blob and globular move around. Flagellates use the flagella, or big tail, to move. Ciliates use little hair-like things to move. And sporozoans use spores to move. So that's how the four animal-like protists are separate from each other. So here we go. Here's a great picture of an amoeba. And yes, there are good and bad amoebas. I'm sure you've heard in the news of an amoeba that's found in warm fresh water in the summer. And if it gets into your nose or brain, it could cause death from an amoeba. So amoebas can definitely be harmful. They can also be harmless, too. It just depends on which one. Um, they form pseudopods to engulf food particles. So the pseudopod is like a fake foot, and it uses that fake foot, kind of like right here on the pseudopod, it uses that to eat and like entrap it and like surround what it wants to eat, and it surrounds it, and then it gets brought into the amoeba itself. <coughs> so that's one of the things that amoebas do. They can use a fake foot, but a pseudopod, to eat different cells. That's called endocytosis. In the cell, eating the cell, endocytosis, that's what that means. And the cytoplasm extensions act like arms. So here would be an arm of the pseudopod or the amoeba. Here would be an arm of the amoeba. Here would be an arm. So almost like a, like a really ancient starfish, kind of. It'll use its extensions to grab onto things, and it'll open up its mouth-ish area called the pseudopod to eat different cells. That's why it's animal-like. <coughs> Flagellates, <coughs> that's easy. They use a flagella, a tail here, a tail here, a tail here, or a tail here to move. Um, they have whip-like tails that help the cell move. Some act as parasites, while some are beneficial. You'll, you'll get the trend. Um, everything that we're going to be talking about, some are good, some are harmless, some are bad. Ciliates, all these little hair-like extensions on it. Looks like a little mouse or something, but no, this is much smaller than a mouse. But they use cilia to move. These ones use a big tail to move. These ones use little hairs to move. These usually live in aquatic habitat underwater. And sporozoans, they produce spores, which is a reproductive cell that forms without fertilization and produces a new organism. Um, internal parasites, these are bad ones, but um, parasites are an example of sporozoans that can be found in animal blood or intestines. They produce spores, just like mosses and ferns plants produce spores to reproduce. It's like a little bud of itself. So do sporozoans. They release little bugs of their self to reproduce more. Okay? So many protists are disease-causing parasites. Most commonly, malaria is an example of an animal-like protist. Sporozoans and malaria. Mosquitoes carry the spores of a protozoan called plasmodium. 
and they infect humans if they bite them. So that's how humans get malaria, from mosquitoes. Mosquitoes bite them, and then the plasmodium protus goes inside your blood or skin, and they re reproduce by releasing spores all inside of you, inside wherever you got bit. And that causes a big problem unless you get it fixed quickly with medicine. Um, it can They can reproduce asexually just by, you know, producing double coffee from itself. And they form spore-like cells that enter the red blood supply and reproduce rapidly. So that's pretty crazy. But malaria is an animal-like protus. It comes from mosquitoes. And once a mosquito bites somebody, it's released inside the person where it will reproduce until it is killed by medicine or by your white blood cells. And yes, Alana, uh, that's a good question. Ebola is another good example of that. And then we have fungus-like protists as well. Um, fungus-like protists include, well, they act like fungus. Um, they include slime mold. Um, they can decompose. Remember how fungus decomposes things? That's a good thing about a fungus. Well, fungus-like protists also decompose, so that's good. They can do that. Um, they cannot move at one point in their life, or they could move at one point in their life, um, and then they begin to grow on something and kind of stay put. So that's really what fungus-like protists are. There's not many of them, but slime mold would be an example of that. And Alex, you don't really need to worry too much about mosquitoes and malaria in the United States, but in other countries, like in Africa, yes, definitely. Um, they have vaccines for that, though, so as long as you take a vaccine shot, you shouldn't get malaria. And then the last kingdom that we're going to talk about today is fungus. So first of all, examples of fungus include mushrooms, like we see here in our picture. Some are tasty. Uh, mold, you don't want to eat that. But yeast, you can use that to make other foods, like bread as well. They are eukaryotic, just like us. They are heterotrophic, just like us. They are decomposers, not like us. There is few unicellular fungi. Um, yeast would be an example of one. But they're mostly multicellular, just like us. As you see, things are becoming more and more like us between bacteria, which is the furthest from us, protus, a little bit more like us, fungus, even more like us. Look, we have, we have this in common, we have this in common, we have this in common. So the more advanced living things get, the more they become like us. The fungus structure, it's a lot like, it almost looks like a tree, right? Well, it is kind of like that, except it's not. It's a fungus. Hyphae are the primary structural units of fungi. Hyphae are like the tubes inside of trees or the tubes inside of mushrooms. Um, that is where are the beginnings of roots inside the mushrooms. That's what hyphae is. Mycelium is the thick mat of hyphae underneath. This is still part of the fungus. So if I were to draw an actual mushroom, it would be this entire picture, not just with the top part that you see. So the fungus is made up of two main parts, the hyphae, which are like the roots, and the mycelium, which is the mat of roots underneath of it. Believe it or not, and, I, and don't quote me on this, but I, the, the biggest living thing on Earth is not, you know, a, a blue whale. It's actually a mushroom. I believe it's called the golden mushroom um, that lives, I'm going to say, in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, because of the size of its mycelium, it takes up the size of, like, a small town. So it's, it's the largest living thing on Earth. Believe it or not, it's a mushroom. So I learned that the other day, too. So good information. But know the structures. Hyphae is, the, like, the roots. Mycelium is like the thick mat of roots underneath of it. All of it is part of a fungus. 
the part you see of a mushroom is the only reproductive structure. Down here is the main part of it, but the mushroom part that sticks up is the reproductive structure. Spores form and are released from the gills underneath the mushroom cap, which is how a mushroom reproduces. So have you guys ever really looked at a mushroom? Have you ever looked at like the weird gill-like things that are underneath of it? Um, if you turn a mushroom upside down, well, those are the areas where the mushroom releases spores. So what happens is a little spore comes out, and then it goes somewhere else, and then it'll bud to form its own mushroom over here. Or a spore will release out, travel wherever, and form another mushroom over here. It just depends. Uh, but that's where it releases its spores, and it reproduces asexually. That means it reproduces by just releasing spores of itself. However, there are also, just like everything, there are good and there are bad, and they're also harmless. Uh, but these are some bad examples of fungus. They can cause some diseases, um, such as corn smut, which is destroys corn kernels, as you can see in this picture here. Also can cause wheat rust. You can see this in Florida sometimes. Um, that's a fungus. Um, there's also a fungus that I'm battling with my palm trees right now. Um, so fungus can be bad for some plants, um, but they can also help as a decomposer, too. It just depends on which one you're talking about. Um, this is another bad one, athlete's foot. I was lucky not to have this in my life yet, but it's a fungal infection um, with a lot of athletes. That's why they call it athlete's foot. Um, it's caused by just sweat mixing with a fungus. And this fungus causes extreme itching until you find a way to take care of it with creams or with antifungal creams. So that's definitely a bad example of a fungus. Also, um, animals can sometimes have diseases from fungus. Cordyceps is a good example of a fungus that attracts a certain species of grasshopper in the rainforest of Costa Rica. Um, I didn't see this when I was there last month, but it, it is something that is there. It's a fungus that actually attaches to small insects and grows and uses their bodies to reproduce and uses their bodies to feed from. So that would be a bad animal disease there, too. Positives, though, we know fungus can be positive. They are decomposers, so they clean up all the dead stuff in the, in the forest. Um, they break down complex organic substances into which raw materials, which living organisms need. So without fungi, we wouldn't be here because they break down important dead stuff and return those nutrients back to the soil. So that marks the end of bacteria, protus, fungus. So now I'm going to ask you guys some questions to make sure we get our, um, first of all, make sure you're paying attention. Second of all, to get your attendance purpose for today. So please answer these in the chat box. Um, just want to make sure that we know more now about bacteria, protists, and fungus. So first of all, how many kingdoms and what are they of bacteria are there? So how many and what are the names of the kingdoms of bacteria? How many, and what are the names of them? There's technically two bacteria. Do we remember the name? I'll give you a hint. One means ancient bacteria. One means true bacteria. Okay, good prefix, Mary. Yep. Paris, good job. It's archaea bacteria and U bacteria. Archaea bacteria is the ones found in crazy areas like volcanoes or hydrothermal vents underneath the ocean. U bacteria is found everywhere else. Um, 
going back to another question about bacteria. All right. So with bacteria, how are they classified? Tell me three ways on how you can separate bacteria. What would you, if you were to, to classify bacteria, what are three things that you would study from them? Or what are three characteristics of how they are separate from each other? Shapes, yep. What else? Cell wall composition, yep, gram positive or gram negative. What's one more? We got shape, cell wall. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I guess you can say the way they act. That might be a later one to, to separate them. But definitely shape, definitely cell wall. Yeah, how they eat, autotrophic. Right here, shape, cell wall, nutrition, respiration. That's how they classify them, um, based on what they eat, if they breathe oxygen or not, what their cell wall is made up of, and their shapes. Yep, good job. All right, so we know the roles. They could be decomposers, symbiotic, or harmful. Um, what about the protus? How many, well, protus is one kingdom. But how many types of protus are there? How many categories of protus? Good, there are three. What are the names of the three? They're very easy. Yep, animal, plant, or fungus like. Yeah. It depends on which one they act more like. Algae, red algae, um, those are going to be your plant-like protists. Animal-like protists are your amoebas, flagellates, ciliates, or sporozoans. Remember, amoebas move, flagellates move with the tail, ciliates move with hair, sporozoans release spores. Um, which one of those four is malaria? Is malaria... Um, an amoeba, a flagellate, a ciliate, or a sporozoan? Which one is malaria? Good job. It is a sporozoan. Um, those are the ones that get injected and release spores to, to take over. Good job. And then we talked about kingdom fungi. Um, what are the two parts of a mushroom? What are the two main parts of a mushroom? Characteristics or not characteristics, but what are the two main functional parts of a mushroom called? It's okay if you don't spell it right. Yep, hyphae is your like the roots around the reproductive structure, and the mycelium is the mat underneath it. And because of that mycelium, that leads to the largest living thing on Earth, the golden mushroom. Good job. And believe it or not, I believe that mushroom looks so very similar to the, the mushroom that was in uh, Mario Brothers, too. They made that for a reason. Um, so there's some sort of history with that, too. I, I don't know exactly what, but that mushroom is a real mushroom. Um, look it up. Read some stuff about it. But anyways, that's kingdom fungi. We know the hyphae and the mycelium are the two parts of it. And then we know how it reproduces, too. It releases spores, little pieces of itself, from the gills underneath the mushroom. And those will just land wherever and begin to live just like the other mushroom, just like you see right here. This mushroom here probably released spores to form these other mushrooms that are below it. That's how they reproduce. And we know plant diseases are caused by fungus. Human diseases are caused by fungus. Animal diseases are sometimes called by fungus. It just depends. Um, but they can also be good. Remember, they're decomposers. We can eat them. We can actually even extract some fungus to make medicine called penicillin. That's from a fungus as well. All right, guys, we are all finished. Um, I hope you guys learned 
something new today about bacteria, protists, or fungus. Those are your three um, main um, parts of early life. Um, that, and that includes four of the six kingdoms of all living things. Archaeobacteria, eubacteria, protists, fungus. That's, that's four of the six kingdoms right here on today's live lesson. Next week, we're going to be talking about plants, the fifth kingdom. And then you can assume after that it will be about animals, the sixth kingdom, which includes us. So thank you guys again for coming. Hope you learned something today. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time, when we'll be talking about plants. It will be more interesting than you think, so show up and hope we'll see you then. So thank you guys for coming, and we'll talk to you later.